I would like for you to turn in your Bibles to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. Have your bulletin handy. The notes that we have today will be helpful uh, for you to to, I encourage you, as usual, to write down the words. It gives you something to think about, keeps you on track, and gives you something to look at a little bit later. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Several years ago, not that long ago, three or four years, uh, we were in Michigan, seeing family there. And I got acquainted with a gentleman who was retiring as an associate pastor. And he had been a senior pastor before and he had put in uh, almost 50 years into ministry. And um, there in Grand Rapids is a seminary which pumps out, uh, you know, um, preachers and trains them for ministry. His son knew a young fella who was graduating from the seminary. And he said, well, you know, it would be nice to have lunch with that fella and kind of encourage him a little bit and uh, find out where, where he's going. And so they, they had lunch together. And the man who had been in ministry for nearly 50 years looked at the young fellow about 25 years old. He had gone to college for three years and he was now graduating from seminary, which is traditionally three years. So he's about 25 years old. He looked at this young fellow and said, well, wh where are you going in ministry? What, what, is, what do you have in your, in your mind? What do you want? And here was his response. I would like to be the senior pastor of a multi-staff church. Which you have a multi-staff church, you're looking at four or five hundred people. He said, I'd like to be the senior pastor of a multi-staff church right now. He said, I would like to be paid $10,000 per month. I want full medical I want full retirement. I want a book allowance. I want a conference allowance. He hasn't pastored one day in his entire life. Never been on staff. But here's what he wants. The veteran preacher looked at him and said, let me ask you a question. He said, do you have car insurance? He said, yes, I do. Why do you ask? He said, son, I hope you enjoy your career as an Uber driver. <laughs> because you don't belong in the ministry. You don't belong in the ministry. He said, the young fellow said, well, you're offending me now. He said, oh, no, 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 no. I'm trying to help you. What you're saying offends me. He went on to tell a little story of how when he was a young man with a young family, he pastored in Corvallis, Montana. I didn't know there was a Corvallis, Montana, but I found out it's a little town Corvallis, Montana, years ago, he pastored there for a while. He said, I was a young man with a wife and three kids working a full-time job as a pastor, working another full-time job and collectively making about $800 a month. The reason that it is so difficult for us here at Bethel 
to find the next man for the future. We need that man. We need him now. We need a young man. And and this is the 800-pound gorilla in the room. We all know about it. We're doing fine. Things are going well. We have a good crowd. Look at this. But we need the future. And we need to find a younger man that can help us bring in some younger families and kind of reboot the educational ministry of the church and then maybe uh, later on uh, find that young fellow taking over and uh, hopefully someday I might be able to slow down a little bit. But I want to tell you something, my friends, that is a very, very difficult process. It's very difficult. And when you have a seminary graduate who thinks that he deserves that right out of the blocks, we have a problem in, in the ministry today, and I'll just, uh, the, I, I, this is the world I live in. It's not necessarily the same world that you live in, but the problem we have in the ministry today, we, want, we have people who want everything that quickly. They want everything handed to them on a silver platter. And these new generations know very little about the word sacrifice. They know very little about that word. We have a couple of veteran pastors here today. We have one right here. Vern Scott pastored for 20, 25 years. I can guarantee you, it was rough. It was hard. Did you get rich doing it? <laughs> oh, okay. There's Vern Scott. Ray Scott. You pastored for 30... 30... 30 some years. Did you get rich? Uh, I came almost 100 miles from it. <laughs> 100 miles from it. Okay. All right. <laughs> close. But I can tell you a lot of years, a lot of hard work, a lot of struggle. The ministry is not easy. Now, it's not the intent for me to to make you feel sorry for me. Please don't. I I don't need need that. But I want to, we're going to relate it here to the Word of God because some of the struggles are the very things that Paul the Apostle went through. Earlier this year in June, we took a sabbatical. I was gone for four Sundays. Why? because you need a little break in the action. You have to have a little pop-off valve. And, and Ken McLean uh, preached for us a couple Sunday. Nelson preached for us one Sunday. I had Nelson preach and then I called Ken and I said, put it back together. <laughs> no, I was, I think we were down in Georgia and I was watching it as we were, while Darla was driving, I was watching the service live. It was excellent. You ready for this? 1,500 pastors quit the ministry every month. Listen to this statistic. 80% of seminary and Bible school graduates who enter the ministry will leave within the first five years. In the last three months, 40% of all pastors have considered leaving their churches. You will never know what that's like. It's not yours to know. God didn't call you. God didn't put you in the ministry. And if you're not called, stay out of it. It's that simple. 
Someone went to Spurgeon many, many years ago and they said, well, uh, boy, I don't know. I, sometimes I think I'm called to ministry. Sometimes I think I'm not called to ministry. If he said, if you can help it, stay out of it. If you can't help it, then you're called. But it can be tough. If you go into ministry, you'll be taken advantage of, misunderstood, lonely, depressed, used, abused, and in many cases, broke. Pre-COVID, pre-COVID, 60% of all pastors were bivocational. What does that mean? Two jobs, sometimes three jobs, two or three jobs, two or three jobs. I've done that myself. Not currently, thank God, but two or three jobs. One thing that I have insisted on all these years, I grew up in the late 60s and early 70s and there were some things that were good about the culture. Looking back, there were some things that were bad about the culture. But I wanna talk for a moment about something that was good about the culture and I think that it was, I think there was an openness, there was a transparency. And I think I picked up on a little bit of that. The concept of be real, be who you are, be transparent. Don't become something just because you're in the ministry. Just be who you are and be real. Just be real. Hence the title for the sermon, The Vulnerability of transparency. When people are transparent, when they are real, when you can actually look at them and see whatever you see, there's a vulnerability there of being transparent. I'm not the Apostle Paul, but I see things in the life of Paul that are for every preacher and are for every Christian. If you don't think this is a tough job, try pastoring a church during a pandemic. Oh my word. Oh my word. There were things we did right. There were things we did wrong. Some people were angry because we shut down. Some people were angry because we opened up. I mean, every preacher that I knew got it from every possible direction. There's no way you can find a, a, a book somewhere that says, here's how to pastor a church during a pandemic. And we'd never been there before, and hopefully we never go there again. Amen. But it was tough. It was tough. How do you do this? What is too light? What is too heavy? What is, how do we do this? As you will recall, we shut down for a couple of months. We started live streaming. The, uh, we started recording the sermons. You'd go online and pick them up. And, you know, we, we did that for a while. And then we prayed about it. And we said, well, we need information. And I'd never been there before. Had no idea. And so we prayed about it and talked to the, some of the men here and we, we kind of made a decision to kind of open up the service. And if you recall, 95% of the people were, were wearing a mask. We didn't know. We were trying to be careful. We were trying to be cautious. I cannot express to you the disappointment of having people begin to become upset because we shut down. 
I cannot express to you the disappointment of people who said, you should have never shut down. Other people said, you, should, you opened up too quick. And what if you'll recall what I said when we did start having services, I said, look, we, we have never been here before. Let's go slow. Let's, we, we're going to do some things wrong. We're going to do things, we're going to make some mistakes. Not intentionally, but let's just work together. We had people that, you know, as usual, are uh, some think this way, some think this way. Well, respect these people over here, respect those people over there, and we'll work it through. It was tough. It was very tough. In your Bibles this morning in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, we're going to see an autobiographical sketch of the Apostle Paul. And it was tough. Follow with me. Verse 3. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforteth, comforteth us in all our tribulation. There he starts that we may be able to com comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. Notice verse 14, verse 4, he's talking about tribulation. Verse 5, he's talking about suffering. Verse 6, whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings by which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. For our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as the partakers of the sufferings, so shall we, ye also be of the consolation. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. Put a pause button right there. Are you kidding me? Seriously? Paul says, we've been through suffering. We've been through misunderstanding. We've had trouble in so much that we despaired even of life. Paul said, I want to tell you something. It's gotten so bad, there have been times... I wish I could die. Yeah. Verse 9, But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Ye also helping together by prayer for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world, and more abundantly to you, word. For we write none other things unto you than, the, than what ye read or acknowledge, and I trust ye shall acknowledge even to the end. As also ye have acknowledged us in part, that we are your rejoicing even as ye also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. Not long ago, I had uh, some lunch with a pastor friend. He's actually um, stepped 
out of pastoring and now is doing another form of ministry. I'll never forget several years ago when he decided to leave one church and went to another. And I've never seen anyone so broken in all of my life. We stood on the curb before we got into the car. It was up here at Grant Road at Abbey's Pizza. And I've never been around anybody so discouraged and so deep with hurt in all of my life. I didn't know what to do. And so I said, come on, come over here for a second. And right there in public in front of God and everybody, I embraced that man whose body shook with emotion. I have a grandson. I have dreams. But boy, if he ever said, Papa, I think I'm going to be a preacher, there would be some, there would be some rejoicing, but there would be some real tall conversation. Paul said, this is Life. This is ministry. Now keep in mind, this was the same guy who said in the book of Philippians, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. There's two sides, every coin. Two sides to every coin. Here's where I'm going with the sermon today. Be real. Be transparent. Don't be false. Don't be pretentious, but know this, that if you are transparent, you lay yourself wide open. Whether you're a preacher or not, if you're real and transparent, you will lay yourself open to some great negativity. However, the benefit of being real and transparent and the blessings that come with that far outweigh the negativity of misunderstanding. I want to direct your attention to the rudiments of transparency. What are they? Look very carefully with me at verse 12. Number one, Paul lived with a sincerity of conduct. If you're going to be transparent, what does that mean? It means to have a sincerity of conduct. Look at verse 12. For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God. There are no charges of moral wrongdoing in the life and ministry of the Apostle Paul. Probably one of those reasons is because he was transparent and lived with a sincerity of conduct. When you got Paul, you got the real thing. You didn't get, some, uh, you didn't get somebody who said, well, you know, I'm a Christian, but, you know, let me show you who I really am. No, Paul was a Christian who said, I am a, what I am by the grace of God. He was transparent. Number two, Paul lived with a consistency in motives. Look at verse 13. For we write none other things unto you than what ye read or acknowledge. There was a consistency of motives. Paul never was charged with wrongdoing morally 
nor with wrongdoing relationally. Here's number three. Paul lived with a confidence upon examination. Notice the last part of verse 13. And I trust ye shall acknowledge even to the end, as also ye have acknowledged us in part, that we are your rejoicing even as ye also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. No charges of theological wrongdoing. We live in an era where we have seen repeatedly those who are in charge and religious figures who have violated trust and violated any vow that they ever made to the Almighty. There has been wrongdoing morally. There's been wrongdoing in relationship. There's been theological wrongdoing. It seems to happen all of the time. One way to avoid that is to be real and to be transparent. Now, everyone has visions in their mind of what people might look like or what you might experience if, if you were around them. Um, I think probably everyone here has uh, had an opportunity to be near uh, a famous figure of some kind. In, oh, about 2002, 2003, I went down here by Pasco up at Ice Harbor Dam and I shook hands with the President of the United States, George W. Bush. Yeah, I haven't washed that hand since. I thought that was kind of cool. I thought as the line went by, as he went down the line, I thought I'll, I'll, there's no way I can get there. And the line kind of thinned up a little bit. And I thought, well, maybe I'll give that a shot. And then a fellow next to me yelled out, said, Mr. President, I pray for you every day. And the president looked at me like I was the one that said it and said, thank you. I need it. Yeah. I thought that was kind of cool. We all have a vision in our mind of what some people are supposed to look like. Have you ever tried to envision the Apostle Paul? Okay, let's try to envision that together. Number one, he's a Jew. Number two, number two, he said, my presence is contemptible. There was something about when you met him and looked him in the face that caused you to recoil. Now, most scholars believe that he had a disease of the eyes. And it was something when you met him, you went, oh, oh boy. Boy, that's not the best looking guy I've ever seen in my life. He wasn't even the best preacher. He was, he, was, he was a Baptist, all right, because the Bible says the book of Acts, he preached for hours. <laughs> so he had Baptist credentials. But he was not a great preacher. On one occasion, there was a fellow that fell asleep and fell off where he was standing. You remember that? Because the preacher went so long. No, what you had in Paul was not this outstanding, big, tall, good-looking, olive-complexion fella. You probably met a little Jewish fella like that, not keenly dressed, probably with an olive complexion, maybe a little bit of a hooked nose. This is it? This is the guy that God entrusted to write major parts of the New Testament 
Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd uh, first and second Timothy, first and second uh, uh, Thessalonians, uh, uh, the book of Titus, and a lot of people believe the book of Hebrews. This is the guy that God entrusted? This guy? I mean, if he was the pastor of your church today and you're doing a website, there might be some thought of maybe we ought not to bring a close up picture of him on the website. the greatest Christian who ever lived, the Apostle Paul. Someone said 150 years ago, the world has yet to see a man who was totally committed to Jesus Christ. And a fellow by the name of D.L. Moody said, by the grace of God, I will be that man and that's fine, but really it had already been answered. Now, the thing that is most obvious about Paul is not his stature, not his look. That's the way that I envision him, by the way. What was the most outstanding feature of the Apostle Paul is when he said, I am what I am by the grace of God. Nothing, nothing fancy, just real, just transparent. That is our challenge for today. Be real, be transparent. A moment ago, I mentioned the late 60s, the early 70s. There were some things from that era that, that, as I said, there were some things that happened that weren't good. But there were a lot of things that happened that were good. And one of them was a the concept of dialogue. You remember that? And I think that we have benefited from that, by the way. And we benefit from a fresh wave of dialogue. It was a previous generation that said, this is what I believe, I'm not interested, I don't want to know people on the other side of the issue. Well, that new generation said, now wait a minute, I may, I may disagree with them, but I can still be civil, I can still be real, we can fight like cats and dogs. And then when we're done with it, we have one more fight, and that's who's buying lunch. There was something back in that era that said, okay, I'll, I'll listen to you. All right? Now that I've listened to you, I think you're a bigger moron than I thought before. But you know what? I don't like you. You're my moron. I don't want to have a relationship with you anyhow. That's real. That is transparent. You might say, well, Pastor, you talked about a sabbatical. Uh, took off a month. You going to do that again in 2025? <laughs> yes. We'll take a little break here and there. Step away. By the way, the preaching... That's the easy part. That's the easy part. It's pastoring people. Like these. Don't look at me like that. It's pastoring. Sometimes it can be, sometimes it can be very tough. It can be very harrowing. Yeah, we'll take some time off. You might say, when? Well, we have a grandson who will graduate from kindergarten the first week of June. 
And I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to figure out that Papa and Nana will be there for that graduation. We're going to be there, God willing, because we need some time off. I was thinking about this last summer. Let me say this to you real quick. Uh, when we came back first part of July, um, I have preached every Sunday except one. I don't miss. I, I believe it's important for me to be here. When people come here, they want to hear the pastor. They don't want to hear a song leader. <laughs> they want to hear the pastor. I, I feel like maybe I should have preached this a little differently. But I uh, am on a web, now it's a Facebook page. And uh, it's pastors who are just kind of a chat room. And I'm not overly emotional. That's not the first thing I gravitate towards. But here recently I've seen a rash, a whole bunch of people making entries, some with a name, some anonymously. I usually don't respond. I usually say a quick prayer, Lord bless that fellow, you know, uh, whatever he's going through. But here recently, recently, I made an entry, a little post. Of course, it had my name. And what I put in there was this. If you need to talk, you can find me on the internet. Now, that never happened, but I wanted to extend that to him. Let's pray together. Father, I'm in the ministry. Lord, we all are in the ministry. We're Christians. We bear the name of Christ. And yes, sometimes we experience what the Apostle Paul experienced. We get to that point where we wonder if we're going to make it. We wonder if we're going to be able to take that next breath. And then we think of the Apostle Paul. And then we go higher yet and we think of Jesus and what he experienced. And Father, make it happen in our lives that we appreciate Jesus even that much more. The reason we do what we do is for the glory of Jesus Christ. Father, bless your word in Jesus' name. Amen.